Femoral neck fracture usually occurs in elderly women and is usually produced by a minor trip causing a twist of the neck of the femur. Typically, there is lateral rotation and shortening of the lower limb. The length of the limb is measured from the anterior superior iliac spine to the medial malleolus. Both are palpable bony surface anatomical landmarks. In a plain anteroposterior radiograph of the hip region, the inferior margin of the neck of the femur should form a smooth continuous line with the superior margin of the obturator foramen. This is known as Shenton's line. Fracture or dislocation in the hip region disrupts this line. Here is the normal side with an intact smooth Shenton's line and this is where the line is disrupted because of a fracture of the neck of the femur. Now returning to the anatomy of the deformity that results from fracture of the neck of the femur, we mentioned that there is a lateral rotation. This lateral rotation is produced by the short muscles in the gluteal region. These include piriformis, obturator internus and externus, the gemelli, superior and inferior gemellus, and quadratus femoris muscle, aided by gluteus maximus muscle, which also contributes to the lateral rotation. Apart from lateral rotation, the deformity also includes shortening of the limb as measured by the distance between anterior superior iliac spine and medial malleolus. Shortening is produced by the superior pull of muscles connecting the femur to the hip bone or the lumbar spine. These include the gluteal muscles, the hamstrings, the adductors, iliosaurus, where saurus major is attached to the lumbar spine, and also it includes some of the flexors of the thigh, such as sartorius and rectus femoris, which are proximally attached to the hip bone. Sartorius is attached to the anterior superior iliac spine, and rectus femoris is attached to the anterior inferior iliac spine. Now let's deal with the attachment of the capsule of the hip joint. The fibrous capsule of the hip joint forms a sleeve, a fibrous sleeve, that encloses the hip joint and most of the neck of the femur. It is attached proximally to the edge of the acetabulum and the transverse acetabular ligament. Here is a close-up view of the acetabulum, the hip joint socket. It shows the C-shaped articular surface, also called the lunate surface, and also shows the acetabular notch inferiorly. The notch is closed in life by transverse acetabular ligament. Note that the articular surface does not occupy the whole acetabulum, but there is a non-articular acetabular fossa that is occupied in life by a pad of fat, the haversian pad. Distally, the capsule is attached to the neck of the femur as follows. Anteriorly, it is attached to the intertrochanteric line between the greater and lesser trochanters. Posteriorly, the capsule extends halfway along the neck of the femur and it is attached proximal to the prominent intertrochanteric crest. That's to say that the entire neck of the femur is intracapsular anteriorly, while posteriorly there is part of the neck that is extracapsular. The head of the femur has a non-articular part that is excavated by a pit or fovea for the attachment of the ligament of the head of the femur, which is also called ligamentum teres. This is a coronal section of the hip joint showing the head of the femur and the acetabulum. Note the whitish hyaline cartilage covering the articular surfaces and the ligament of the head of the femur extending from the pit on the head of the femur. The other end of the ligamentum teres is attached to the transverse acetabular ligament which bridges the acetabular notch. In this section, we can demonstrate that some fibers of the capsule are reflected back upwards along the neck of the femur. These reflected fibers will form longitudinal bands called retinacular fibers. The retinacular fibers bind down the nutrient arteries that extend from the trochanteric anastomosis to the head of the femur, along the neck to supply the major part of the head. 
Thus, fracture of the femoral neck within the capsule ruptures the retinacular fibers and the vessels, causing avascular necrosis of the head. Now let's deal with a more detailed description of the blood supply of the head of the femur. Before dealing with how the blood vessels reach the head of the femur, let's deal with the source of these blood vessels. The trochanteric anastomosis provides the main source of blood supply for the head of the femur. It lies in the trochanteric fossa, hence the name trochanteric anastomosis. This is the femoral artery close to the base of the femoral triangle. After providing small superficial branches, it gives off a large branch, the deep femoral branch, also called profunda femoris artery. Profunda means deep. The profunda femoris artery is the main artery of the thigh. The profunda immediately supplies a medial and lateral circumflex femoral arteries. As the name circumflex indicates, both of them went around the femur. The anastomosis, the trochanteric anastomosis here, is formed by an ascending branch from both medial and lateral circumflex femoral arteries. Here is the ascending branch contributing to the trochanteric anastomosis of the lateral circumflex femoral artery and the medial circumflex femoral artery located here has a transverse branch that contributes to a cruciate anastomosis which we are not concerned with at the moment but it has an ascending branch that contributes to the trochanteric anastomosis together with the ascending branch of the lateral circumflex femoral artery. Two other arteries contribute to the anastomosis and these are a descending branch from the superior gluteal artery and a branch from the inferior gluteal artery as well. However, the blood vessels are derived mostly from the medial and lateral circumflex femoral arteries. Branches from the trochanteric anastomosis run in the retinacula of the fibrous capsule of the hip joint, as has been mentioned earlier. These fibers run along the neck of the femur to reach the head. Note that on the dry bone, the neck has many pits for these retinacular arteries to pass into. Blood may also reach the femoral head through a branch of the obturator artery that runs in the ligament of the head of the femur. Here is the branch of the obturator artery that runs along the ligament of the head of the femur reaching and supplying the head of the femur because the ligament of the head is attached to the pit or fovea on the head. The obturator neurovascular bundle leaves the pelvis through the obturator foramen to pass into the medial or adductor compartment of the thigh. It is at this location that the obturator artery runs close to the acetabular notch and contributes a branch that is carried by the ligament of the head to reach the head of the femur. Remember that the ligament of the head of the femur is attached on one side to the fovea and on the other side it is attached to the transverse acetabular ligament that bridges the acetabular notch. It is clear from this description that fracture of the neck of the femur will interrupt the blood supply from the root of the femoral neck. The artery of the ligament of the head is insufficient alone to supply the head of the femur. In addition, in old patients in whom fracture of the neck is likely to occur, this artery is often not patent because of atherosclerosis. Thus, death of the proximal bone fragment takes place. This is what is called avascular necrosis of the femoral head. Necrosis means death and avascular means absence of blood supply. So death because of absence of the blood supply. Avascular necrosis is more likely the more proximal the fracture to the head. This is called a subcapital fracture. A subcapital fracture cuts off most of the retinacular supply to the head. On the other hand, a peritrochanteric fracture does not damage the retinacular supply to the head. Because of the high possibility of development of avascular necrosis, replacement of the femoral head and neck by a prosthesis is recommended.